Hi everyone and welcome to the second episode of Microphone Tense in the Trenches. My name is Luca, uh, I'm uh, uh, your host today and uh, uh, with me there is a fantastic guest. So Warren Fitzpatrick from Danelm. Danelm is uh, a great e-commerce uh, that is well known here in UK. Uh, and today Warren will tell us more about their uh, experience with Microphone Tense. So hi Warren, how are you? Hello Luca, yeah, I'm fantastic, thank you. How are you doing? Can't complain at all. So I think uh, we have a lot of ground to cover uh, and not much time. So I would like to really deep dive uh, as soon as possible into, into the topic. But first of all, uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. So I guess first and foremost, uh, personally, I'm a husband and a father. Um, I've got two small children at home that keep me extremely busy. Uh, but when I'm not doing that, uh, I'm a principal software engineer for Dunelm. I've spent the last 20 years working in the tech sphere. So I did my first five years in um, hardware and software support. And that's where I really discovered my passion for software engineering. So I remember all the way back then, I created um, a PHP server um, with IIS, like physically um, in the sort of server rack. Uh, and with that, I was able to build uh, the internal intranet pages for the sites. Uh, and I also built the um, the digital signage sort of software around those sites as well. Um, but yeah, I lasted five years doing that before I decided I wanted to you know take the plunge and be a software engineer full time. Uh, so that was 15 years ago now. Uh, and in that time, I've worked across a few industries. So I've been working across the, the automotive industry. I've been in the travel industry. Uh, and I've also worked in the retail industry, which is pretty much where I am now with Dunelm. Um, in general, though, uh, I'm a full stack engineer, so I can pretty much turn my hand to anything, really. Um, but my main passion definitely leans towards the front end side of things. Uh, and I'm also quite a keen optimizer as well. Um, I, I just love trying new ways of serving web pages and features and, and really just getting the most out of things. Um, I'm a really firm believer that you, know, you don't always have to implement new features. Um, people are often really surprised by just how much difference you can make by you know, just improving what you have already. Uh, so yeah, that's that's me in a nutshell. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. You have a lot of great skills. I think uh, optimizing code uh, uh, is a fantastic uh, skill that uh, everyone should uh, aim to have in their career. Uh, I was uh, like you, I spent a lot of time refactoring code because uh, it's where I learned the most. Uh, because it's easy when you have like greenfield project, uh, slightly less when you have like brownfield that you need to update and uh, evolve. But okay, so I know that in, in Danel you're using microphone tents, and everyone here is curious to, to understand more about uh, what you are doing with microphone tents, uh, why you choose the, the architecture, and what was the journey so far. Yeah, yeah. So I guess a little bit of context there. Then um, Danel have. Uh, an extremely popular website. We've got, uh, we see over 400 million user sessions every single year. Uh, and in order to shape and maintain that, we've got 11 of our software engineering teams that actually contribute to one big monolithic project. So this way of working over time um, actually leads to teething issues, which we've seen, which slows us down. Um, and since, you know, every single one of those 11 teams, they, they have their own focuses, they have their own goals and roadmaps, um, you know, communication between those teams tends to become difficult as they scale. Uh, and we run into challenges with things like shared ownership. Um, we've also seen performance degradation slowly over time. Um, and obviously, because there's limited communication between the teams, the project has grown vastly complex. Uh, and it just becomes really difficult to make changes confidently. Um, so, yeah, with that growing complexity, you know, tests become flaky, pipelines fail, um, and it just prevents teams from releasing, essentially. So we think that, you know, ultimately, micro front ends can go away towards solving a lot of those issues for us. For instance, we'd have uh, clear ownership of different parts of the site. There'd be less complexity, as engineers would technically be you know, dealing with a smaller part of the website at any one time. Um, we'd only need to run tests on the parts that have actually changed rather than running them all, all the time. Um, and yeah, so re releases on, on, on that vein would actually be a lot less risky as well since they're smaller. Um, but most importantly though, micro front ends enables teams to work in a more isolated way, which effectively it allows us to have that many teams 
uh, working on the website and actually even the ability to potentially scale beyond that. So that that would be why we're interested in it. Yeah, I think you already uh, share quite a few great insights on why you pick this, this path over others. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that overlaps uh, very nicely with the, the strengths of distributed system in general. Uh, but I know that uh, when you have uh, done the first attempt on microphone tents, uh, it didn't went uh, as planned. So can you tell us more? Yes, that's right. Uh, so, God, where do I start? I guess context is always good. So we have uh, this analytics data, which suggested to us that the checkout would be a really good area to improve as it could create a pretty significant uplift. So we saw that as our opportunity to tackle those improvements alongside uh, our first test towards, you know, migrating that part uh, to be an MFE. Um, some other con context as well is that we had time constraints. So we were already seeking compromise, like right from the very start of that project. So with all that in mind, um, we built the checkout as a standalone application, but we built it within the same repository as the existing monolith, uh, but we had it so that it had its own separate pipeline. So it could be uh, deployed and tested uh, independently. So we did this primarily to save time as you know we could reuse a lot of the components that already live inside of that repository. Uh, so yeah, when we eventually went live, we saw really, really good results in terms of like uplift to conversion and things like that. Uh, and that was mostly driven by the improved performance that we got in, in the rebuild. Uh, but the celebrations didn't last too long, unfortunately, as we started to see tests failing. Uh, so yeah, what we found was is that changes in the existing website were causing the checkout tests to fail and changes in the checkout were causing the existing website's test to fail. Essentially, the checkout and the existing website were too tightly coupled uh, by those shared components. Uh, and due to these issues, we were unfortunately, um, we, we had to put those two projects back together again. So when you release one, you have to release the other just in case any of the tests fail and you have to fix them. Um, so I guess ultimately, the lesson that we learned there is that you should limit what you share between micro front ends. Otherwise, you just end up creating too tight a coupling and uh, you run into issues similar to this. But um, luckily, you know, we didn't walk away empty handed. We still had the checkout converting a lot better than it was before. Uh, and also, more importantly, we had a very valuable lesson about MFEs that we could, you know, take away and implement in the next version. Yeah, I think uh, uh, you, the lesson that you learned in the hard way, unfortunately, uh, is uh, one of the things that I'm always preaching, uh, to be very careful on what you share and what you don't uh, in, in microphone tense, because very often, um, especially new teams are struggling a bit to understand uh, what is the best way to design microphone tense, what should be shared, what shouldn't. And uh, I, used to, uh, I used to say, start let's say very easy with the, let's say most common things like login library design system and then build up your shared uh, system if and when needed because sometimes we still have the mindset of uh, oh we should share like we did with components but microphone tents are completely different so thanks for sharing uh, uh, this insight is definitely valuable okay but for what about the second time when or the second attempt of building microphone tents how how does it does it go yeah, no, it went, it went really well. And actually, um, the most challenging part of that wasn't necessarily the technical part. Um, so I, I guess I could sort of start with the, the sort of challenges there. So when we implemented the, the current version that we have of micro front ends that we're using in production today, it involved building like a whole platform around it, which was, uh, it was a significant investment on Dunelm's part. Uh, and I actually, I know this question comes up quite a lot uh, in talks like this, and, and I'm not surprised that it does as, you know, easily the hardest part for me was getting the appropriate buy-in from senior stakeholders uh, and convincing them of the value amongst uh, like an already busy and valuable roadmap. Um, but yeah, how I ended up overcoming that was uh, quite interesting. It was It was by looking at the benefits a little bit differently. So in the beginning, uh, I was just way too focused on our technical issues and how this helps with them. Uh, and that message, unfortunately, it just wasn't resonating with everyone that it needed to. So I had to change my focus onto like the overall size of uh, the total opportunity 
and what value that it actually brought to the business. So we went away uh, and we, we dug deep into this data to, to find out what that value was. Um, and for instance, we knew that there were large opportunities for improving website performance. Uh, we used data to find the size of that opportunity. And, and what we did is we compared the conversion rate of pages that loaded faster on our website to ones that loaded slower. Uh, and the results spoke for themselves as the difference was huge. Um, so yeah, we knew that there was an, an extreme amount of value um, that was associated to improving the, the performance. And that was it. we was able to sort of bring that to the conversation. Uh, and regarding the fact that, you know, we, we said that we had those difficulties and we saw our lead time increasing. Well, the bottom line of that is that it physically costs the business money. Uh, so now we're having a very different conversation about cost savings rather than technical issues. So we, we spent try, uh, time trying to paint a really clear picture of, you know, what we were actually dealing with in the pipeline. So they knew like what engineers were struggling with. Uh, so we tried to work out, you know, roughly what this might be costing the business as well. So internally, um, I'm trying to coin a term called the probable release time. Uh, so if you actually have a higher failure rate in your pipeline, you can use this to paint a clearer picture about your uh, like probable release time. So if I explain, uh, if you've got a pipeline and uh, just for simplicity, we'll say that it takes an hour to run and you've got like an 80% failure rate and spoiler alert with the flaky tests that we had, we were seeing similar numbers to that. Um, so if you have an 80% failure rate, that's the same as saying that it succeeds roughly 20% of the time. So statistically speaking, you will probably need to run that pipeline five times to see success. And obviously, since the pipeline takes an hour to run, that gives you a probable release time of five hours. Uh, so that kind of helps paint the picture of what we're actually dealing with. Um, and if you've got anything like uh, release windows, uh, like we do, so you know we release during certain business hours, uh, which is like preferable for the business. Um, and that might only be five hours, for instance. So if, if you didn't start trying to release your change at the very start of the day, you're probably going to be releasing tomorrow. Um, so, you know, that that paints a picture uh, and you can even go one step further than that. Um, we worked out how you can actually more accurately work out the time that's wasted um, in that process. So, um, for instance, you can take a time period if you take like three months you can have a look at how many active contributors you've had in that time frame. So people that have created a branch, people that have run a pipeline, um, and then you count the number of failed pipelines that you've had. And this includes reruns. So if you've run a pipeline, the tests have failed, and then you've had to rerun it, the counter goes up by one. So you, you count these pipelines. Um, and then you have a look at what your test run duration is. So for instance, when tests fail, uh, you don't tend to run the entire pipeline again. You know, you'd probably just run rerun the test step. So what we did is we took the the sort of P95 of that test duration um, and we came to somewhat of a formula, which is the number of failed pipelines times by the test duration divided by the active contributors. And what this actually gives you is the time wasted per active contributor over a time period. So you can you can take that and extrapolate it even further across the year. So you can work out roughly what flaky tests are costing your business uh, and use that in conversations. Um, and obviously that doesn't include other time wasted, like uh, like dead time between reruns. So for instance, you know, it, as soon as the tests fail, you're you're rarely there to see the second they fail and then you rerun it instantly. You know, there's going to be dead time between that. You might be making a cup of tea. You might be focusing on something else. So you've got to pad it out for that. Um, and also there's time spent fixing issues. Uh, and in our case, time spent, you know, chasing other teams on fixes as well. So you can pad the numbers out a little bit and, and take that into consideration as well. So, um, you know, hopefully this is starting to sound pretty expensive. Um, so yeah, we, we looked at other things as well. We looked at, uh, improving accessibility. Uh, so yeah, our UX team, they did a bit of research around that. Uh, and they found out that actually, if we improve the accessibility on our website, it would actually increase our customers reach by as much as 15%. So, you know, since we're going to rebuild our components anyway, to, to make way for MFEs, this was another fantastic opportunity for us to tackle that at the same time. 
uh, and it adds even more weight to you know why we should build MFEs. So I guess like just to give a summary of that, it's, it's not just about the benefits of MFE, but it's actually the entire scope of opportunity uh, and why the effort is worthwhile. So yeah, I guess like once we got the buy-in, uh, the rest pretty much fell into place. But that, that that's fantastic to be honest. Uh, I think uh, it resigned very well what you just shared uh, with me because uh, I'm a big fan of data points, and I know when you are talking a higher level of the business, you need to to change your uh, language and try to find parts that are more sensible for them, like lead time, uh, like how fast we can deliver new features and stuff like that. I think your approach uh, is very, let's say, systematic and uh, allows everyone to, uh, let's say, take the same approach and replicate. But out of curiosity, did you think to write down uh, how to calculate these things and provide some, uh, let's say, replic replicable, replicable mechanism uh, that will enable others to apply exactly the same thing in their organizations? Uh, I haven't actually written much of this down. So I think I'm feeling a blog post coming on. Perhaps I can put something together because I know it's it's a popular question, yes. isn't it? So perhaps like have a, a blog post like, you know, how to how to convince your business that you need MFEs. Um, I think that'd be a pretty good one. Absolutely. I think it would be a brilliant one also because uh, I think you, you really nail it on how you describe the fact that you are, um, let's say, looking at what is the baseline that you had before and then how much you can improve it and how much freedom uh, and, and speed of delivery you can reach. I think that uh, is, is a fantastic testimony, testimony of, of the work that we have done so far. So thank you very much for sharing. I think it would be a great gem no for many people that are listening to us. Yeah, and, and just to be completely honest about that, you know, it's not it's not something that we got right first time. You know, it was Indeed. it was very much you know pe people not being convinced, and then thus going back to the drawing board and going back to the drawing board. So this is kind of like my retrospective look at it. If I were to do it again. I'd absolutely tackle it like that. Totally. But to be frank, I believe that it's quite normal. Uh, I used to say that uh, um, that distributed systems are living systems, so we need to take care of them and nurturing them. And it's difficult uh, with all the different moving parts to nail it at the first attempt. But the fact that you now have arrived to a certain level of maturity that uh, you're capable to articulate uh, the, the right path for that, I think it would be extremely valuable for, for the microfrontends community. Absolutely. So I know that uh, uh, one thing, and you highlighted also before, um, one thing that is also core in Danaomi is the testing part. In several, let's say, several parts of your answers, uh, you mentioned testing, testing here, testing was flaky, we could improve testing. So how do you test microfrontends now? Yeah, so testing the micro front ends is a very, very interesting conversation. So I guess if you take, um, you know, unit tests, that doesn't really change too much. I think the, the obvious benefit that you get there is that, you know, you're you're chopping it up into multiple slices. So the idea is, is that <clears throat> your unit test will always run with every release. But ideally, you'd only want to run, run the ones that are relevant to the things that have changed. And you kind of naturally move towards that with MFEs since, you know, th that you're testing smaller slices of it. But it gets really interesting when you start looking at things like integration tests, because integration tests can have uh, you know many forms, but essentially you can test a group of components together as an integration test. Um, but because MFEs have physical boundaries between them, that's where it starts to become really interesting. So you can almost think of it like um, a contract between two MFEs. If you have uh, an MFE that relies on another MFE for something, like, I don't know, an event being fired or data being stored in local storage or something like that. Um, so as I say, we, we kind of call this a contract uh, between MFE boundaries. So how do we tackle that? Originally, we thought about using actual contract tests by you know using something like PACT. But after going down that path, we discovered that PACT doesn't really lend itself well to what we were trying to achieve. Uh, and actually, the solution ended up being a lot more simple than that for us. So in the end, we decided to carefully document, you know, any instances where this happens uh, and just ensure that the MFE, which contains the logic or owns the logic, that, that it just has a test that appropriately covers it. So having said that, uh, we also see contracts like this as a form of coupling. So it's something that we actively try to avoid where we can. Uh, and actually, in reality, there aren't actually that many instances um, where it happens for us. 
so I guess my advice here would be just make sure that these types of contracts are well documented somewhere, covered in tests. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be too clever uh, and actively avoid creating contracts where you can. Uh, and also, if you have a bit of functionality that's shared absolutely everywhere, then you should probably ask yourself, can this be promoted to a microservice and handled in isolation away from your service? So, for instance, uh, to give an example, like the, the concept of a basket, um, this is used in, in loads of places uh, in you know, e-commerce websites, and it's very, very well suited to be a microservice. So this way, MFEs can just fetch state and data uh, from the service instead of relying on each other and, and forming these sort of contracts between MFEs. And I suppose finally, you've got end-to-end -end tests as well. So we kind of see that on two levels. Um, you've got one level of end-to-end -end tests, which is you only really want to test the journeys that are changing. Um, and then the other level is, but actually, don't you need to test the entire user journey? And that's where a challenge comes in for us, because if you're reasoning about your part of the application, you don't have the other MFEs and the rest of the application available at that sort of point. So the way that we're thinking about it now is that we would have um, like a, a, a thing that we deploy to. So we would deploy the version that you're about to release to like the full journey. And we'd test only very, very critical tests that go across the entire journey. So these will be things like making a search, finding a product, adding it to the basket uh, and purchasing it. So things around tests around that, keeping it extremely minimal. Um, but on the other side of things, you know, if you're releasing a product detail page, then you would test end to end only the journeys that happen on the end on, on the, the product detail page. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, uh, I like the fact that uh, it's really well thought. So that you, from your explanation, it's clear that, that you really thought from uh, unit integration uh, with a good emphasis on integration and end-to-end -end testing. Uh, and uh, I like also the fact that you're saying, um, yes, unit test doesn't change. Integration test, we, we prob probably went too far and then we, we move back. Uh, to a more uh, easier um, solution. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's uh, very valuable uh, explaining uh, the, the, the importance obviously of testing also in microphone tests that are totally doable, but moreover that you don't have to overcomplicate things or create custom solution for, for this kind of activity. So uh, thanks for sharing that, it's very, very valuable. Um, I know that um, uh, your architecture basically is uh, divided from what you describe uh, in, in pages and you are testing this boundary and stuff like that. Um, how did you come up with uh, those boundaries? So what, what are the metrics, considering that you are extremely passionate and rightly so about metrics and data points, uh, what, what is the mechanism that you use for saying, okay, this is a microphone time, this is uh, another one? Yeah, so I think that was really born from our uh, organization, organizational structure. So the dream for us really is to have cross-functional teams that own a complete vertical slice in their area. So for instance, we might have teams that work more around the checkout. Uh, they might deal with things like um, orders and deliveries and stuff like that. So because of that, um, that's how we're kind of structured internally. It would be great if we could have the front ends that would marry up to that. So they'd have complete control of the presentation layer in that area and also the surrounding services as well. So really that led us to sort of try to chop it down by page type. Because in, for instance, the product listing page, you've got the uh, search uh, and browse, you know, there's massive, massive journeys with lots of complexity. And there are teams out there that own the services around there. So it only feels right that they should also own the presentation logic. So I think really it was born out of that. Um, and I guess my advice there would be, you know, not to try too hard to sort of go against how you're organization is already structured because if you know the, the changes start to become absolutely huge at that point so if it can synergize with how your teams are already laid out then you're onto a winner and and really that was that that was how we came to it oh, yeah that, that that's a valid point i think um one thing that often we forget is that the conway's law uh that always kicks in uh so we design our uh system based on our organization structure so we need to, to let's say be respectful about the organization structure and take into account when we are designing these things so definitely uh, is an ace for me um so i know that uh, you 
for so you are server side render because uh, I believe as e commerce uh, that that's usually the most common approach that you're uh, taking. Uh, so what 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 are you using out of curiosity? So are you using some popular frameworks? Are you using custom solutions where they are hosted? Yeah, so um, not, nothing too crazy. So we're actually, it, it's completely custom. We're just using um, something as lightweight as possible, really. So our existing website was um, a custom single page application written in React. Um, and really, it's not too much different from that. So I guess if you can think about it, it's um, serverless architecture. So we're using lambdas to render the different parts. Um, and actually, our application shell, which we're rebuilding currently, is also using something similar. So the, the idea is just to keep it really lightweight. So for us, I guess the focus is about performance, um, because when we went live with our first MFEs, the, the performance was night and day for us. So we're really trying hard to protect that. So we did previously have things like Next.js um, on the application shell. But actually, all, all we really ended up using it for was um, a router. So it ended up being a waste in the end. So what we've done is we've actually taken a different approach. We've just stripped it right back. So we, we definitely favor in-house built solutions and we have a very keen eye just to keep everything lightweight. So it's, it's nothing too crazy. It's just um, a very lightweight React uh, and Webpack kind of setup with Module Federation. Nice. Uh, so you're using also Module Federation then? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's another sort of performance uh, type focus for us as well. So the application shell uh, pulls in the the sort of the header, the footer and the content, which is the, the only three horizontal slices that we've got across um, all, all of our uh, boundaries. And the reason for that is just to sort of keep it simple. As we kind of uh, alluded to earlier, you know, keeping it simple, especially at the beginning is definitely key there. So um, yeah, in order to make it faster, we've got a lot of the same dependencies that are getting pulled in on the header footer and content. So it made sense for us then to, you know, save the customer downloading it three times uh, and just try to combine them together with module federation. Makes sense. That that let's say simplicity is, is the key for, for good architectures. <laughs> so um, the one thing that I want to drill down a bit um, is the the choose the why you have chosen uh, uh, serverless and lambda function because I think uh, I personally believe, but uh, maybe people would think that uh, I'm biased here. But also before joining AWS, uh, I was a strong believer that uh, uh, lambda and, and serverless will have uh, a great place in organization uh, like yours, for instance. So can you tell us a bit more why you you went through that route uh, compared to other solutions? Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, it, it was made pretty easy for us, to be honest, because Dunelm, as, a, as an entire business, really has adopted a serverless first approach to literally everything that we build. Uh, and we always use AWS to do it because it's just absolutely jam packed with every single tool that you can possibly imagine. And I probably don't know half the tools that are in AWS, even now, you know, working with it for so many years. Um, so yeah, it was an obvious choice to sort of start there for us. And, you know, if you consider the legacy website was also built with similar tech as well. Uh, and part of our focus was to get up and running quickly. So because we had a lot of the things that in place already, things like pipelines and stuff that synergizes with lambdas, uh, it was, it was a great place for us to start. But, um, I suppose speaking about micro front ends, like in, in a serverless architecture, I also think that it's a really well suited choice. Uh, so I suppose I, I could list a few reasons. Um, pretty much every single business cares about the bottom line. Uh, and since you only pay for what you use, uh, it really, really keeps those costs to a minimum. So that's definitely number one. Um, so yeah, I guess you know that we use Lambda to render our pages and scalability is something that really just comes out of the box with that. Uh, in, in fact, we don't have to do anything to prepare for even our peak periods where scalability is concerned, like Lambda pretty much just does its thing. So that that lack of needing to think about that just frees up our engineers to, to just focus on what's important. Um, yeah, serverless architecture is, it's really easy to define and deploy as well. So we actually use CDK to define our stacks and that makes it super, super easy for us to replicate entire applications between environments like, you know, QA, pre-prod and prod. We, we have separate AWS accounts for each of those. And because we build things as infrastructure as code, it, it just makes things super, super simple, super nice and quick to deploy. Uh, so I guess for MFEs, that makes it really easy for us then to just grow the number of MFEs that we have. Because, you know, architecturally speaking, 
changes between MFEs are going to be really, really minimal. You're just going to be sort of replicating what you've got with each one that you that you create. So yeah, very, very, very advantageous. Yeah, that's great to hear that. Uh, and I'm glad that you you find a similar conclusion that I had in mind uh, uh, also in, in the past. So um, yeah, we, we are heading towards the, the end of this conversation, but uh, I would like to ask you if you can share with us uh, some, uh, um, let's say, outcomes of, of this approach. Now you have, let's say, it's been a while that uh, you're working with microphone tents, uh, and what in your eyes uh, are the benefits of, of this approach? Yeah, okay. So I guess it is still early days for us just to be completely transparent because technically we only have uh, three MFEs live in production, which is like our header, footer and product detail pages. Uh, but I can tell you about some of the sort of key benefits that we've seen there. So um, yeah, MFEs in this area already uh, are released twice as often as our whole legacy website on average which is absolutely huge. So clearly you can see that, you know, lead time has been reduced there. Um, and, you know, the reason that we're able to do that is because there's just so few roadblocks in the way. Uh, and the cognitive complexity of releasing, you know, a smaller part of the website just makes things faster and simple. Um, other benefits, we've got dedicated ownership from a single team as well. Uh, this is really useful to, to any business really, is if anything goes wrong, you know exactly who you need to call. Uh, and actually, this is something that we didn't get um, with our legacy website, because with so many teams working in there, you know, the, the lines between ownership can get very, very blurred. And it's, it's a bit frustrating for the business, not necessarily knowing who best to contact uh, or even getting hold of the right person. Um, so I guess we also have more flexibility now in terms of how we handle our traffic. So since we can send any URL to a brand new MFE if we wanted to, the opportunity to scale without impacting performance is absolutely there now. Uh, and this flexibility means that, you know, we can more readily adapt to change without having to do more fundamental work in order to enable that. So, yeah, I think th those are like the high level key benefits for me. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you have highlighted uh, a very interesting points. Um, uh, and I know you are probably at the beginning of, uh, of, of the journey, but it's great for all the work that you have done so far. Uh, and uh, how you rationalize the topic, I think, is uh, uh, despite it's the beginning of the journey, you have done quite a lot of uh, uh, work and foundational work, I would say, that uh, would be beneficial for everyone, honestly, listening uh, to this interview. Um, the last question I have for you is, uh, imagine that uh, uh, you have like a friend, of, well, your best friend that uh, is working in another company and uh, would like to start uh, or they are thinking to use microphone. So what would be your advice? Where you would be put the emphasis for having a successful starting point with this uh, architecture? That is a very good question. Um, so I guess, firstly, I would always start with, do you actually need micro front ends? So, I mean, as right. we've discussed today, it's quite an expensive endeavor um, and it certainly adds a lot of complexity to a project and you know it doesn't come for free uh, <laughs> so i think you know, prematurely reaching for micro front end architecture it could be a costly mistake so make sure that you need it first and foremost um, so assuming that you do need it uh, i'd say be careful how you decide to split your mfe boundaries because what's worked for others might not necessarily work for you so um, as we sort of mentioned earlier, take into consideration the ownership required for the different parts uh, and how they can synergize with your existing teams and your existing operational model. So really, it should be put in place to back that up rather than to sort of make any fundamental changes to it. Um, try not to create too many horizontal slices prematurely. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can sort of inadvertently create more of those contract situations that we mentioned earlier. So, yeah, I think it's one of those two way door decisions that you can really decide later if you need more. So definitely keep it simple, especially at the start. Um, I'd also say something that was important for us, which is consider creating a dedicated enablement team and give them ownership over the core parts of your whole MFE platform. So these are things like the application shell, uh, and really anything that's foundational that affects all of your MFEs. Um, 
Oh yeah, and of course, <laughs> learn from our mistakes as well. Um, try not to share too much between MFEs. They absolutely work best when they're more decoupled. Uh, and I guess an anti-pattern to avoid there is avoid having a shared state that wraps your fragments, like definitely have loosely coupled communications where you've got something like uh, an event emitter, for instance. So you've got that clear boundary between MFEs. Um, and finally, if you need to sell this to stakeholders, think about the overall opportunity uh, and anything that it unlocks for the business. Like even if it's loosely related to MFEs, if it adds value, then it's going to add merit to your request. Yeah, and, and yeah, I guess that's that's, that's great. That's a great list. I I fully agree with you on uh, starting uh, uh, to slice, let's say, more coarse grain. Uh, then immediately going straight away with an horizontal split where you have multiple micro frontends in the same page, uh, because uh, you are always uh, um, you have always time to move further um, when when you have more clarity on why you need to split and what you need to split. But moreover, there is a I would say another uh, interesting point here uh, that is. Um, the other way around, so if you have like two teams working on two micro frontends and then you want to merge them, is by far a more bumpy journey compared to, to the splitting a micro frontend because uh, at least the code base is written by a single team uh, and therefore uh, you have, let's say, it's an easier path for, for handling that. Uh, and very often, you know, um, I've seen, uh, uh, let's say, uh, teams that are in, in starting this journey uh, to let's say start immediately to go in uh, the most difficult way to handle and then reaching out a point and say, oh yeah, we screw up, so we need to go back. But that takes way more time than uh, instead yeah. starting more coarse grain and then slowly but steadily uh, decide, oh yes, probably this one start to be too much cognitive load, let's start to split that. So I really like that point. I think is uh, a super valid, uh, valid point that uh, everyone should take into account uh, into that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess you get into like analysis paralysis as yes. well. I think you, you can spend, you can sometimes spend longer speaking about something and then obviously you're arguing your points to and from when actually keeping it simple, you're going to get a lot further, a lot faster. And as I said before, you can always change your mind um, so long as you've not gone too deep, but keeping it simple first, it just defers those important decisions until you've got all of the knowledge. So once you're sort of in production with something, you can make a much better informed decision about, you know, things that are going to have bigger ramifications. So yeah, definitely start small and grow out. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's great because uh, um, this approach, uh, honestly, uh, and also the, the modularity of, of distributed system enables you to have this evolutionary mindset that uh, really helps you uh, in this situation like you described. So I start simple, then I start to see that uh, there, are, there is friction that it might not be because you screw up the design. It might be because the business changed. Maybe you have more teams to, to onboard, or maybe there are other people that now a domain that were at the beginning uh, or an area that the beginning wasn't, let's say, so important for a company, now became uh, vital for, for the future of the business and therefore they want to have faster iteration or whatever. Therefore, certain decisions uh, might change over time that that's normal, I would say. And the fact that you have modularized uh, your application will should enable you and should work for you uh, in this situation where you say, okay, now, now we need to split or now we need to move towards that direction. Uh, that I really like as, as a, a good takeaway. Warren. Absolutely. Yeah. If your architecture is resistant to change, yeah. then it isn't a very good architecture. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. I fully agree, especially if it's a distributed system. Um, yeah. Warren, what can I say? It was uh, fantastic. You shared a lot of amazing insights, uh, way more than I expected. So thank you very much uh, on behalf of the, the Microsoft Dance community. I think it's, uh, it's great hearing uh, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and uh, and you brought a lot of uh, experience and definitely uh, a well thought and rounded approach for uh, starting the journey with Micro Frontend. So thank for that. Yeah, no worries at all. Happy to share, and the pleasure's been all mine. I'm waiting for uh, reading your blog post on how to to sell Micro Frontend to to your boss. I think it would be very beneficial for everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone that is uh, watching this video. I hope to see you in the next interview of my Fifty Cents.